Hey, hey, hey. How are y'all doing today? Woo! Welcome, welcome to church. All right. Welcome, welcome. It's church night. What's up, everybody? Hope you're having a good day. Hope you have enjoyed yourself. Let me, uh, we're just going to wait here just a minute. Just let other people get on. Let me see here. How y'all doing today? All right. Huh. So, you know, I'm doing well. I miss y'all. Can't wait to be with you. Uh, I'm just going to see if this is showing up on Facebook. Yes, it is. All right. So, what is going on, my church family? What's up? What's up? What's up? Pastor Matthew. <laughs> I just found out I can have sound effects on this program. Let me see here. I, I feel like I feel like being applauded. Applauded, right? <laughs> All right. Good job. Yeah. That's for you, whoever's whoever's there. Who is with me? Who is on right now? Give me your name. Give me a shout out. Let me know how you are doing today. I want to know in two, no, three words or less, what are you most excited for at, for the end of this quarantine period? Is coming to an end for us here in Indiana? We're starting to do this whole rollback, whatever, uh, reopen Indiana. We're going to be having church on the 24th. Um, Mary, what's up? Mary, in three words or less, what are you looking forward to the most? Oh, all right. John is on. He, he is all eyes. He is all eyes today. So, all right. Three words or less. What are you most excited about when you get back to the rhythm of life? I know some of us are, I know my wife, she was talking to me. She said, I'm not really ready for the busyness of life to come back again yet. So, uh, if you're not ready for that, let me know. I just getting just, uh, see here. What else we got here? You got a party noise maker. <laughs> Yay. That's for you guys. That's for you who just showed up, who joined us. Here's, some, here's another thing. All right. I know I'm being silly. We're just going to we're gonna chill here for just a minute. Uh, we got, if you have any prayer requests, let us know. Let me know. I'm going to put this up there on the top um, there up there. So going to church, says Mary. We are here, Charles Payne. Hey, Chuck, how's the shoulder doing? All right, so tell me what, in three words, what are you most excited for about getting back to life, getting back to the way things were? Give me, give me a, give me a, a three words or less. Three words or less. Be creative. I need the most creative response. Mary's got going to church. I know some of you could use that as well, but let's let's pick something else. I'm excited for you to be at church too. So. Mary, I've been praying for your uh, daughter and your and her family. They're going through a rough time right now, so um, just want to let you know we're uh, we've been praying for. Her. So, all right, give you guys a couple minutes. All right, I know three words for me. Uh, three words for me is going to be football season. I know that's only two words. Football season. I'm looking forward to college football. I'm believing, I'm trusting, I'm having faith that it's going to be played this year. I I don't want to think of the alternative. I I don't know. It would be a rough year for me. I, I would be a sad, grumpy boy every Saturday if we didn't have college football. All right. No mask. I Oh, I bet. I bet you're tired of those things, aren't you, Tammy? Uh, thanks for all your hard work at Walmart. All right. Anybody else? No mask, college football, going to church. Let me see. Seeing grandchildren. I've been hearing that. I hear that. Uh, my parents have been saying that. They they can't wait. Uh, we surprised my mom. <laughs> Family, church, friends. Oh, that's good. Way to use just the words. Yeah, that's awesome. I love it. All right. We uh, surprised my mom with the surprise Zoom with all our grandkids and kids for uh, Mother's Day. So. I hope you guys had a good Mother's Day. We wish we could have given all you mothers a hug on the neck and a gift on Sunday, but we didn't have church here. So, all right, well, we're going to get started here in just a minute. Um, I was just waiting just a few moments, and then we're going to get started, dive on in. So, um, 
let me hide these. Marching season. Oh yeah, I hear that. Oh, I don't hear that. I know I didn't. I never marched, but I know how important it is. I know how fun it is. So, yes, she's marching season. Should be coming up soon. All right. First off, let's pray. We have a few people to pray for today, tonight. Um, Lois, let's lift up Lois and Dewey in prayer. Um, if you haven't heard, it'll be in the it'll be in the papers and online soon. But Bertha passed away this morning, and so we got to. I want to lift them up for, in prayer. The funeral is going to be on Sunday or Monday. Oh, pardon me. The funeral is going to be on Monday. Showing is on Sunday. I don't know what the rules are going to be. Restrictions are going to be for that stuff. Um, but let's lift them up in prayer. If you, as you think about them, please lift up Lois in in this hard season and Do- Dewey as well, as they're mourning the loss of Bertha. So, um, I know. Uh, I, I hope I can share this. Sue has surgery Monday, so let's pray for Sue. I hope that's okay for me to share. Um, and everybody's been seeing Mary's comments on Facebook about her daughter. Uh, Julie and her whole family. So let's lift them up in prayer. And then we're going to dive on into the last week of the Who is the Holy Spirit? Asking for a Friend series. We're going to dive into the last part of that tonight. So Lord, we just lift up this night to you. Lord, we need you in our lives tonight, just like every other night. But Lord, I pray that you'll speak to us tonight. Open up our hearts to hear what you want us to hear. Lord, I pray that you will um, be with Lois and Dewey right now, Father, as they're mourning the loss of Bertha, Lord. I pray that you will just be with them and their whole family. Let your presence and your peace be upon their household, Lord. Lord, I pray for, for Sue and I pray for other, I pray for Julie and, and, and her whole family, Lord God, uh, uh, Mary's daughter, Lord. I pray, Lord God, for all these situations, Lord God, that your hand will be upon them. And Lord, take this night, be glorified in this evening. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hey, listen, we're going to pray again at the end of service. So if you have any prayer requests, please go ahead and post them and I will find it. I have now muted the comments, so I won't be seeing who's coming on and what you say. But uh, feel free to share away. Feel free to type away an amen or whatever. Uh, But let's have fun tonight. Listen, I don't know if you know much about me, but I'm in ministry because of a revival that's hit this land. Back in 1996, there was a revival in Pensacola, Florida called the Brownsville Revival. I got my life changed radically by God at the revival as a student, as a high school student in my senior year in high school. And then I went back for ministry school to that school, to the Browns Revival School Ministry, and I trained for my first in my first two years of ministry school. I was there, and then I finished up at a Southwestern and Somebody's God University. And so revival is in my heart; it's in my bones. Wanting to see God move in a powerful way is there. And so when I saw this series about who is the Holy Spirit, I knew I had to preach. I had to share it with you. Again, this is from Doug Clay's series on who is the Holy Spirit, asking for a friend. And in, in, this, in this message today, we're going to look at the aftershocks of what happens when we get filled with the Holy Spirit. What should happen in our lives? What our lives should look like? Listen, this isn't a, a check off the mark, um, step by step thing that you have to do. These are things that the Holy Spirit will do in our lives for us and through us as we spend time with Him in prayer, as we spend time praying in the, in the Holy Spirit, praying in our spirit language, in our spirit tongue. And so just a few years ago, we celebrated the 100th anniversary of another revival, the Azusa Street Revival, which took place back in 1906. Uh, there's only been a few events in the history of, of the church that have impacted and influenced the world as much as the Azusa Street Revival. The revival was much more than an event. It was the beginning of a spiritual revolution that that began in the lives of a few and now numbers over 600 million people worldwide. In fact, our church is here because of that revival. The Assemblies of God was born out of the Azusa Street Revival. In the summer of 1906, the Apostolic Faith Mission on Azusa Street, other known as the Azusa Street Mission, erupted into spirit-filled revival. 
different in scope and fervor from any other revival that has happened before, the spiritual intensity for the Zusa Street revival was red hot for more than two years. What do you mean by red hot? What I mean is people would walk in the building and they would not leave the same. They had it's like it's like the Holy Spirit was so strong in that building that he just got a, that everybody got a God got a hold of everybody's life. During that time, virtually everyone who was anyone within the emerging Pentecostal movement felt its impact. People traveled hundreds and thousands of miles to see firsthand what was going on. Like any major move of God, some rejoiced, some were curious, some were skeptical, and some were critical. One thing is sure, the Zusa Street mission quickly became the grand central station of global Pentecostalism. Most all Pentecostal fellowships have roots in Azusa. The heritage is great, but it's not enough. Every generation, our generation, listen, my heart's prayer, this is why I'm in, in ministry right now. My heart's prayer is to see a new revival in this generation. Because I believe every generation needs a Pentecostal movement, a Pentecost moment. The Spirit does not have to conform to the way that Brownsville was or Azusa Street was. It doesn't have to be the same. It's going to be different. But I believe there's, there's four things that, that happen when a revival happens. And I'm hungry for a shock and awe experience in the context of today's culture where the presence of God is so real that, one, people see their need for Him, which leads to their salvation. Two, Christians recognize their need for power, baptism in the Holy Spirit. Three, hurting people know there's help. We see a healing movement in a revival. At Brownsville, people were healed, both physically, spiritually, mentally, emotionally. Their marriages were healed. We saw amazing things. And fourth, an urgency to reach people becomes overwhelming. We have to, it, it, we have to become missional. We have to want to see God move in our society. We're driven when we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us and we're baptized in the Holy Spirit and we have the fire of God in us. We have to tell someone. That's what happens when we get when we get filled with the Holy Spirit. And so it's interesting to note that the Zusa Street Revival began 10 days prior to the San Francisco earthquake of April 19, 1906. The earthquake lasted for moments, but the Azusa Street spiritual earthquake is still producing aftershocks that are felt around the world. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is not a one-time event. I want you to understand that. If you got baptized in the Holy Spirit last week, it is not a one-time event. It's not one and done, you're good to go. No, it's an ongoing um, It's an ongoing event. It should give us daily aftershocks that are felt by us and the world around us. What are some of those aftershocks? The first aftershock is this. When we're filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit helps Jesus to be seen in us and through us. John 16, 14 says this, He will give me glory. Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit. Jesus said the Holy Spirit will give him glory. It's always been the mission of the Spirit to exalt Jesus. The Holy Spirit has come that we might be deeply impressed with Jesus and be excited about his work. The Holy Spirit was sent by God to make Christ real to people and to show us who he really is. Therefore, the Spirit working through us should do the same. If we have the Holy Spirit in us, if the Holy Spirit's job is to bring Jesus glory and bring people to Jesus and show people Jesus, if we have the Holy Spirit in us, it should be doing the same thing. It should be drawing attention to Jesus, inviting them to love him, Trust Him. Obey Him. Listen, our lives should be a life that is like a magnet for Jesus, where we are constantly drawing people to Jesus, drawing people to Jesus, not to ourselves, not to our church, but to Jesus. Isn't it amazing, though, at times, where people claim to be filled with the Spirit, but they will say things to others or post comments on social media that compromise the fruit of the Spirit in their words? We need, to, we need to do this. So how do we draw people's attention in Christ? In our words and in our actions and in our deeds. The first thing is we should show courtesy. Titus 3.2 says this, Believers shouldn't curse anyone or be quarrelsome, 
but they should be gentle and show courtesy to everyone. 1 Peter 2.17 says this, Respect everyone and love the family of believers. When we draw people's attention to Christ, that we should offer mercy. It says 2 Corinthians 2.7, Now it is time to forgive him and comfort him. Otherwise he may become so bitter and discouraged that he won't be able to recover. Colossians 3.13, Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. When we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we should express sympathy towards people. Colossians 3.12 says, As holy people whom God has chosen to love, be sympathetic, kind, humble, gentle, and patient. And we should speak honestly. Proverbs 24.26 says, An honest answer is like a kiss of friendship. Proverbs 28.23 says, In the end, people appreciate honest criticism far more than flattery. So the first thing, the first aftershock in our life when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, is the Holy Spirit will help Jesus to be seen in us and through us. He should be seen in us and through us. The second thing is the Holy Spirit will convict us. As, as Christians, we're going to become convicted. It says in John 16, 8, And when He comes, He will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. The Holy Spirit convicts us in three areas. The sin of unbelief. The Holy Spirit gives us an awakened sense of sin, particularly the sin of unbelief in Jesus. The Holy Spirit, listen, if we we have something come up in our life, if we have something come up in our life that we know Jesus will have control over, yet we don't trust that Jesus has control, then we're not placing our trust and our hope in Jesus. This Holy Spirit will convict us and say, listen, trust Jesus in this. You don't know how many times, how many times in my life where I'll be stressing about something, or I'll be worrying about something, where I'm like, God, I don't see how you're going to work in this. And I feel the Holy Spirit say, just trust Jesus. He's got this. He's got this. So what's, what's going on in your life? We, so the Holy Spirit will convict us of the sin of unbelief. The Holy Spirit will convict us of the righteousness of Jesus. The Holy Spirit reminds us that it is Christ alone who forgives our sins and provides righteousness for us. The Holy Spirit reminds us that it is Christ alone who forgives our sins and provides righteousness for us. And the third thing that the Holy Spirit will convict us of, give us conviction of, is that Satan is defeated. The judgment or defeat has already been pronounced on Satan. We can't fear Satan. We can't show fear towards him. He's already defeated. And the Holy Spirit will give us that conviction that He is defeated, that He has no more power over us, that Jesus is righteous, and that we need to believe in Jesus and trust in Him in this season and in our life. Therefore, the Holy Spirit working through us should help us respond to sin quickly, live a more victorious life, and be people of conviction. Conviction is good. But here's some things conviction is not. Conviction is not a guilty conscience. This is a natural feeling experienced by most people. A conviction is also not a sense of trepidation. It's also a knowledge of right and wrong. Conviction, the truth is, if we experience nothing more than a ping on our conscience, some anxiety at the thought of judgment or an, or an awareness of hell, then we have never truly known the conviction of sin. Conviction means to convince someone of truth, to reprove, to accuse, refute, or cross-examine a witness. To be convicted is to feel the loathsomeness of sin. To be convicted it means to feel the loathsomeness, loathsome, feel the penalty of our sin. Isaiah 6, 5 says this, Then I said, It's all over. I am doomed. For I am a sinful man, I have filthy lips, and live among people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the King, the Lord of heaven's armies. Wow. That's conviction. When when Isaiah was in the presence of God, he sensed his uncleanness. And that's what will happen when we get in the presence of God. We'll sense our uncleanness, and, and, and in view of God's holiness, Isaiah instantly realizes his sinfulness. To be convicted is to experience an utter dreadfulness of sin. Genesis 39.9 9, 
No one here is, has more authority than I do. He, Potiphar, has held back nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against God. That's where... where <clears throat> wow. Awesome. All right. The conviction is experience of utter dreadfulness of sin. We need to, that, was, that was Daniel. He was talking about, about, about Potiphar and how, how it would be a horrible thing not to sin against Potiphar, but against God. That's the, that's the understanding that Daniel had of sin. To be convicted is to understand how our sin dishonors God. Psalm 51, 4 says, Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just. To be convicted is to understand how our sin dishonors God. Conviction is a good thing. And so the second thing that the, that the Holy Spirit does that when He fills us up is He gives us a holy conviction in our lives. Helps us see where, our, where we're falling short of God's glory and, how, and what to do about it. And then after He convicts us, He's going to guide us. He's going to guide us. It says in John 16, 13, But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on His own. He will speak only what He hears, and He will tell you what is yet to come. We're pretty helpless and clueless in mapping out our lives and getting accurate guidance and direction. The Spirit is especially present and active at every crossroads in our lives when we are making vital decisions. His guidance regarding our future is best because He's already in our future. The Holy Spirit is going to guide us. He'll convict us. He'll guide us and show us how we, what we need to do and what we need, how we need to get out of this sin or not, what we need to confess and how we need to turn our lives around. And, 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 and listen, I tell my kids all the time that when we repent, we, we do a complete 180. We go the opposite way and go the other direction. We go opposite of what we're going, and the Holy Spirit will lead us in that direction. And He'll also show us where we need to go next in our life. I remember when the Holy Spirit, when He, when he guided me, I remember this, this time, this instance in my life where I was just done with college. I had just uh, finished up college, and I was praying. I was walking our neighborhood. I was praying, and, and I felt like the Holy Spirit dropped uh, the name of my last pastor in my mind, and he said, and I felt like I was going to be the next youth pastor there. Well, they were they had already hired somebody and for the new for that position, and so I took another job. And within a couple, within two years, that guy had left, and they had offered me the job. And but the Holy Spirit, He guided me, even though I had to take a little detour. He showed me what I was going to do next. And the Holy Spirit, He does that all the time, as He guides us in our life. Therefore, we should give the Holy Spirit a greater capacity to influence decisions regarding our future. God uses three ways to guide us. The first way that He uses to guide us is through His Word. His Word is always first. It says in Psalm 119, 105, Your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. The secondary guidance is the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is there to guide us. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. That's John 10, 27. And then life circumstances will guide us. That's a confirming guidance, life circumstances. The Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. The guidance of the Holy Spirit is the focus in this message. But the guidance of the Holy Spirit will never contradict what the Word says, ever. Some people say, let your conscience be your guide. Well, this is bad advice because our conscience is not in itself totally trustworthy. Some people confuse their conscience with the voice of the Holy Spirit. They're not the same. <clears throat> the witness of our conscience alone is not always sufficient for the guidance we need. We, hear, we need to hear the whisper of the Spirit. After all, the Holy Spirit lives in us to bear witness with our spirit. But how? How can one distinguish their own thoughts, feelings, and impressions from those of the whisper of the Spirit? Which is a really good question. Have you ever asked yourself, how do I know if it's God or me? 
How do I know? The Holy Spirit's will whisper will always agree with Scripture. Always. An inner impression that an inner impression that conflicts with the Bible needs to be rejected outright. The Holy Spirit's whisper becomes clear when our will is surrendered to God's will. Our desires cannot can mislead us. God's will won't. We need to say, Lord, let your will be done, not mine. When we go through the Lord's prayer and we hit that spot, it says, Let your will be done, not let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We need to line ourselves up with his will, with what he is wanting us to do. Our own desires can mislead us, but God's will won't. The Holy Spirit's whisper distinguishes itself in times of prayer. Prayer sorts out all the other voices of expectation that you hear. And so we need to understand that the Holy Spirit's going to guide us, he's going to convict us, and he's going to, to help Jesus be seen in us and through us. The fourth thing the Holy Spirit will do when we're filled with the Holy Spirit is he'll help manage our moods. Romans 8, 6 says this, So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. Moods are contagious, both good and bad. The real issue, and that what generally gets us in trouble, is how do you handle your emotions? You can either learn to manage your emotions or let your emotions manage you. Although this sounds overly simplistic, the way to manage your emotions is to grow in your relationship with God. When we grow in God, we can manage our emotions better. It says in Romans 12, 1 through 2, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all that He's done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind He will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship Him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is a good and pleasing and perfect. Considering these four truths on how to manage your emotions. Give your emotions to the control of the Holy Spirit every day. That's the first thing you need to do. We need to give our emotions to the control of the Holy Spirit. Romans 6.13, don't let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God, for you were dead, but now you are alive. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Second thing is, first thing on how to control your emotions is give your emotions to the Holy Spirit every day. Don't let anger get out of control. James 1.20 says, human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. So the first thing is give your emotions control the Holy Spirit. Second thing, don't let anger out of control. Third thing, let other people, your good friends, help you manage your emotions. Be careful then, dear brothers and sisters. Make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving, turning you away from the living God. You must warn each other every day while it's still today, so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardening against God. For if we are faithful in the end, to the end, trusting God just as firmly as when we first believed, we will share in all that belongs to Christ. And the fourth thing is we need to stay focused on the things you can control, not on the things you can't control. Psalm 56, 3. When I'm afraid, O Lord Almighty, I put my trust in you. Our emotions are wired into our fallen nature as well as into our redeemed nature. So sin and Satan have access to them and will use them to try to manipulate us to hurt ourselves and others. But remember, to be controlled by human nature results in death. To be controlled by the Spirit results in life and peace. Romans 8, 6. And the fifth thing that we need to do, we already looked at the Holy Spirit manages our moods. The Holy Spirit guides us. The Holy Spirit convicts us. And the Holy Spirit helps us to be seen in us and through us. The fifth thing is this. The Holy Spirit gives us an unwavering commitment to God's Word. The early Pentecostals of Azusa Street did not desire experience for experience's sake. Listen, experience is great. Experiencing a move of God is amazing. But it's, we cannot experience things for experience's sake. But overall, their quest for a personal encounter with the Lord was within the boundaries of God's Word. Leaders of the Jesus Street Mission believe the Spirit does not go 
where the word does not permit. Wow. The Holy Spirit's not going to do things that the word doesn't allow him to do. The Holy Spirit is, is, is subject to the word of God. He's not going to violate the word of God. So the Holy Spirit will give us an unwavering commitment to God's word. As people of the Spirit, we must keep God's word as the ultimate measuring rod for all we do. 1 Corinthians 2.14, The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them as foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit driving us to God's Word and opening our eyes to its meaning, it can seem like it's just another book. One mark of the Spirit baptism should be a hunger to read and know the Word of God. A biblical worldview is learning to interpret the realities of life through the, um, <clears throat> through the filter of Scripture. The result is that we start to think more like Jesus. And so when the Holy Spirit gives us an unwavering commitment to God, it'll, it'll help us to, to, to desire, it'll help us to have our eyes open to its meaning. And then this, a Spirit-empowered church will be a word-based, word-taught, word-governing, and word-influenced church. Even the experiences of the day of Pentecost were described by Peter as a word-associated experience. Acts 2, 16-21. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. The first sermon in the book of Acts. He said, turn with me to the book of Joel. The Bible, listen, the Bible needs to be the main centerpiece of our life. That's why I know it seems so element, elementary sometimes, but I say, if you want to grow in God, get in the word, pray. Listen, the first thing we need to do is get in the word every day. And we need to pray out the Word. We need to meditate on the Word. We need to think about what the Word says. We need to let the Word of God be on our mind day and night. And that's what the Holy Spirit will give us and will help us out with. The Holy Spirit will help us out with that. And when the Holy Spirit does that, when the Holy Spirit helps us be seen, helps Jesus be seen in us and through us, and the Holy Spirit gives us convictions, when the Holy Spirit guides us, when the Holy Spirit... Um, See, manages our moods. When the Holy Spirit gives us an unwavering commitment to God's word, then the Holy Spirit will give us a planned intention to be missional. The baptism in the Holy Spirit, as understood at the Zoo Street Revival, was not just for personal blessing. You weren't baptized in the Holy Spirit for you and just for you. Yeah, you were blessed by it. Trust me, you will be blessed by it. You will be empowered by it. You'll have supernatural power in your life. But it wasn't just for personal blessing. Its central purpose was for empowerment. You see, in many Pentecostal circles, people have sought the baptism in the Holy Spirit for the experience in itself and not for its purpose. The baptism in the Holy Spirit should help you seek, should help you speak in English or your native language with clarity to be a witness for Christ. Listen, speaking in tongues is just the initial evidence. Emphasis on initial. It should not be the only evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. When you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, the Spirit will help you minister and witness to others. He'll give you words that you never thought. He'll bring up thoughts in your mind that, you ne that you're like, I don't know where that came from. It says in Acts 1.8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You'll be his witnesses locally, a little bit outside of your influence, a little bit further than that, and then to the whole world. God doesn't want you just to be where you're at now. He wants your witness to be able to go around and impact everyone around you. Mission, missions was not a concept that came about as a result of the Azusa Street Revival. Missions was very much a part of the revival. They sent out missionaries right away. From Azusa Street came an array of missionaries, ministers, and Christian workers. That's why it's hard for me to think of a church. That's why it's hard for me to think of an Assemblies of God church that isn't missions-minded. That's why First Assembly Church, that's why, we're, that's why we're dedicated to our missionaries. 
and giving our giving to our missionaries and growing our missions base, growing our missions uh, group that we send money to. That's why, because we are a missions minded church. Because the Holy Spirit wants us to be missional and missions minded. It's it, is it possible that we have a a, a redefine redefine uh, sorry is it re- is it possible that we have redefined the Pentecostal experience into an experience instead of a lifestyle? Long before words like intention, intentionality, missional, and global were popular, the Holy Spirit was given to the church to do just that. The Holy Spirit intentionally dwells within us to empower us missionally so that global people can know Christ. Listen, church. The Holy Spirit... He wants to influence. See, there was literally six points, and I could have get, kept going on and on and on about what the Holy Spirit does. But when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, our whole life should be impacted. Everything about us should be influenced, should be impacted, should be changed, should be challenged. We should have a new zealousness in us. And listen, this isn't a legalistic type of situation. This isn't a listen. You. This isn't a, a checkbox thing that we have to do to do all these things, and now we're filled with the Holy Spirit. No, these things come out of us being filled with the Holy Spirit. These things just become start coming natural to us. Yeah, there's some disciplines that we have to do. Yes, we need to, when it comes to our moods and our emotions and, 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 and disciplining our minds to hear the voice of God. Yes, there's some discipline in that, and there's some things that we can do to help with that. But these are things that should naturally occur. These, are the, these things are the fruit of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives in us, ministers to us, and works through us. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is a wonderful experience, but it's only the beginning. It's not the end. The baptism opens us to a whole new realm of operating in the life of the Spirit, being led by the Spirit and ministering the fruit of the Spirit. The initial evidence of the Spirit is speaking in tongues. The baptism of, sorry, Spirit baptism is speaking in tongues. But that's just the initial evidence. The baptism should be further evidenced by love for God's word, conviction of sin, awareness of his guidance, living emotionally healthy lives, pointing us to Jesus, pushing us out to reach the world. And so we need to pray that God will do these things. He wants us to become more and more and more and more like him every day. Every day. The Holy Spirit has filled us up so we can be more like Jesus and so we can draw others to Jesus. Today, I want to pray for you. I'm going to look at these comments and see what's what's out there, see if anybody else posted. I want to pray for uh, you guys as a church family. If you have any prayer requests, please post them now. We're going to be praying in about about three, three or four minutes. And I want you, if you have prayer requests, please pray for those. But listen, I want you to ask yourself, have you been given the Holy Spirit freedom in your life to change who you are, to change you, to make you more like Jesus? Have you stopped at just the tongues? Or have you pursued the other things of God? We need to submit every single part of our body, every single part of our heart, every single part of us to the Holy Spirit. Every day. I like I like what I, this says. It says the initial evidence of spirit baptism is speaking in tongues, but that's just the initial evidence. It should, the baptism should be further follow, further evidenced by the love for God's word. Listen, open up His word, and before you start reading, pray and ask the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, speak to me today. Make this word come alive to me today. Show me what you're wanting to say to me today. Every single word in the Bible 
can be used, the Holy Spirit can use to speak something into your life. Even the most mundane, weird, odd verse the Holy Spirit can use to minister to you. I understand, listen, you need to understand one thing about the Bible. Is yes, the Word of God was written. See, they're all these were all books that were written for an actual group of people at that time. But it's also written for us. It's good for us to know and acknowledge what is written for at that time. But we need to ask, Lord, how do you want to use this in my life today? The conviction of sin, we need to allow the Holy Spirit, we need to spend some time every day. Holy Spirit, show me what's blocking me from being more like you. Convict me of my sin. Seek the conviction of your sin. It's okay. Awareness of his guidance. Ask him to guide you. Ask him to guide your moods and your emotions to help you become more emotionally healthy in your life. Ask the Holy Spirit to point us to Jesus and help him, ask him to show us how we can reach our world. All right, we're going to pray for Sharon. She's in the hospital. I forgot to mention her at the beginning of this of this uh, lesson. Uh, we're also going to pray for Lois and Dewey with them. Um, again, we're going to pray for, uh, let's see, we're going to pray for, um, some people had me pray for them earlier. I'm not going to mention what they are if they didn't comment yet. I don't want to throw out their prayer request. That just feels wrong to me. So uh, those that shared those prayers with me, I'm just going to say those as unspoken. And you can just know we're praying for you there. Um, uh, trying to think what else. Oh, yeah, Julie, um, Mary's daughter. We're going to pray for her and her whole family. I get, man, they got hit hard. Let's just lift them up, guys. Listen, if you think about Mary, just pray for her, her daughters, her kids. They just, they got slammed, man. Slammed really hard. That whole household got hit hard with this virus. So let's pray for them. Lord, we just come before you today. Holy Spirit, we invite you into this moment, into our lives, into our homes. Help us be more like you. Holy Spirit, direct us, guide us to Jesus, point us to Jesus so we can be more like him in our lives. Lord, I pray for Sharon right now in the hospital. Lord, I pray for your hand upon her body. Bring healing, Lord. Lord, we pray, Lord God, for Lois and Dewey, Lord God, right now. Lord, be with them as they're as they're just going through this this season this this morning that they're going through, Father. Or be with Julie, Lord God. Be with her kids, her son, her daughter-in-law, or daughter her daughter and her son-in-law. Be with them today. And her husband. Oh Lord, Holy Spirit, and those other requests that I didn't feel like sharing, Lord God, I pray that you'll touch those situations, bring healing and guidance in the doctor's hands. Be with us the rest of this week. Lord, move in our lives, Lord God. We, we, we want to see you move in your power. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for loving us and being with us and giving us power. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I love you guys. Give me a quick... um. Give me quick, what's what, what, what emoji? Give me something. Give me something really quick as you leave, before you leave. Something in your emojis thing. All right. I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to do the uh, DJ air horn. Off. <laughs> Woo! All right. Another one. All right. I love you guys. Peace. Woo! I love you guys. Amen. There we go. I'm going to wait another minute. I need some more amens or whatever and, and just, wavy hands or thumbs ups or hearts all right let's see see what you guys got awesome i love it all right guys i love you i love you i love you i love you we're aiming for the 24th we'll let you know more as we get closer so boo i love you guys thanks john <laughs>